so thankful that my King is coming soon. He's going to wipe all the tears away. Sing this with us. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. And oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, the purchase of God. His spirit and washed in His blood. Sing it out. Oh, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my Perfect submission, all is at rest. Oh, perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking. 
Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small, child of weakness, watch and fear, find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. Well, good evening. It's our Wednesday night Bible study time, and we're glad that you're here and glad that you're watching. Hope you'll get something out of Romans chapter 12. It's a blessing to come to you and talk to you from God's Word this evening. And so, uh, if you get your Bibles, let's get into the book of Romans, okay? Romans chapter 12 is where we're looking. And we're going to continue our study last week that we started into the last several verses of the chapter. and. Obviously, we didn't have time to finish, and we may not have time tonight. But anyways, we'll do the best that we can. 
Uh, let's continue to pray for those that need prayer. Miss Gallagher, continue to pray for her. Billy Anderson was still in the hospital. Let's continue to pray for him. And we've got others that uh, are, are healing. We pray for Elizabeth Covington and several others today that need God to do a special something in their hearts. So let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to speak to them tonight. Heavenly Father, we're grateful that you love us. We're grateful that we can come to your word and spend some time together as a church family and look at these wonderful passages in Romans. And Lord, I'll be honest with you, this is a tough passage tonight. And we pray that you'd help us. It's not so tough that I don't think it's hard to understand. It's just hard to practice. So Lord, I pray that as we teach it tonight, we would see the necessity of not only hearing your word, but but doing it. And so Lord, bless us. Be with these sick ones, Lord. Be, be with Miss Gallagher. Be with Billy Anderson. Be with their son, Don, that broke his leg. Lord, I pray for Elizabeth Covington this evening. Lord, there are others. We pray that you touch them tonight. Lord, I pray you'd bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you got your Bibles, we're in the book of Romans and we're in chapter 12. And I'd like to start by reading the passage, and we're going to read chapter 12. Oh, let's start in verse 14. Now, tonight we're going to talk about, and believe it or not, doing right when you've been done, when you've been done wrong. How do you like that? Doing right when you've been done wrong. Or maybe we could talk about this subject. How do you handle your enemies? What do you do with your enemies? How do you handle difficult people? I'm sure you don't ever run into anybody that's difficult. Would you agree with that? I'll bet you do. I'll bet you may live with somebody that's difficult. So uh, we're going to talk about that, and we'll spend some time there tonight. Let's look at the scriptures together. The scripture says in verse 14, it says, Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind, one towards another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil, prov providing things honest in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dear, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if any, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him to drink. For in doing so, you shall re keep coals of fire, heap coals of fire upon his, upon his head. Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. You know, there's a couple of things, and I may not mention it. I'll just mention it while I'm thinking about it. There's a couple of old. Uh, ancient teachings or ancient uh, thoughts from these verses. For example, when the Bible talks about uh, rejoicing with them that rejoice and weep with them that weep, they said that the temple, the old Herod's temple, had an entrance on the southern wall and everybody had to go through that entrance and up the stairs, up the temple steps, uh, up into the temple courtyard. And most of the time they would enter and they would leave from another exit, but they would uh, make some of them, they would have a few of them that would have to go back through the entrance and they would come down those steps and there they would look into the face of those that were coming in. And it was a great way of making them look into the face of those that had problems, those that had tears, those that were brokenhearted, and it was a great way to weep with those that weep. Isn't that a, a cool story? True story from the ancient days of the temple there in Jerusalem. And then uh, the Bible talks about when we keep, um, and when we're good to our enemies, the Bible says that we heap coals of fire upon their head. You know, in the old days, you'll see this sometimes on those reality shows, uh, getting fire is so vitally important. You can't cook your food, can't boil your water. You got to get fire. Sooner or later, you got to get a fire started. And sometimes they move from place to place and they have to devise some way to carry coals. They have to carry the coals with them in order to have fire in the next place that they go. And so here the Bible talks about carrying those coals and 
And when we do good to somebody that's done us evil, he says we heap coals of fire upon their head. Yeah, interesting things. Uh, Will Rogers, you remember that name. He was a humorist that said on one occasion, he said, I never met a man that I didn't like. Do you believe that? <laughs> do you seriously believe that? Have you ever run into somebody that rubbed you the wrong way? You know, unfortunately, I, I, that doesn't happen to me very often. Most of the time I give people the benefit of the doubt. You got to be a turkey several times before I pass judgment on you. But you know, um, um, back in the day when I was a pastor, every once in a while I'd rub somebody the wrong way. And boy, I mean, I'll tell you what, I've had some people get so upset with me. And you know, I really hated it when it was my fault. I really did. There was times I could just kick myself for saying something. I should have just kept my mouth shut. You know, I inserted myself in a situation I should have backed away from. And boy, the other day I was going to the church and I had to get some stuff at the church. In fact, what I was doing, I'm, I'm getting some of my books, uh, bringing them home. And so anyways, uh, to be good, nice and kind, you know, things are different right now. So I check the mail. I brought the mail up and put it on the desk and, and where Dwayne looks through the mail. And I, um, I noticed the name of a person that was giving money to Brother Ben Bounds' missions organization of somebody that wouldn't honestly have spit on me if I was on fire. Boy, did they did not like me. And I remember a big, a big deal with that. And it was, it was huge. It was just huge. And I was so surprised. And it's been at least 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, my wife, I'm sure, will correct me on the date. But anyways, um, you know what? I really believe uh, that was somebody that was my enemy. And I think they did their best to make sure I knew that. Now, when we start talking about this, who is your enemy? You know, some of you say, well, I have a hard time swallowing that, Pastor. I um, I don't know if I have any any enemies. Well, uh, let me ask you a couple of questions. You think about them when you don't have anything else to think about. Maybe, maybe that's who I'm talking about. Or it's that person you focus on when you wish you wouldn't. Or could it possibly be that person that you uh, never have anything good to say about? That's the person I'm talking about. That's the person that I'm talking about is your enemy. There was an old English couplet of... It says, a man has that has a thousand friends has not a friend to spare, but he who has an enemy will meet him everywhere. That's good words, and that's true, isn't it? You see, uh, there's sometimes we run into people that we wish we wouldn't have to run into. Sometimes we see them at a service station. Sometimes we see them across the church building. Sometimes we see them in Kroger's, and we run into them and Maybe it's a former mate, or, or could it be that it was once a trusted friend that maybe took advantage of you, or maybe it was that fellow employee that was uh, detrimental to your career. Maybe that's who it is. Or could it be that Christian that took advantage of you? Could it be that person in church that, that hurt you deeply? You know, I, I read a story of uh, not too long ago, about a gravestone of a woman, a gravestone of a woman in a upstate church, upstate cemetery in New Hampshire. And it was a marble stone. And here's what it read, murdered by the ministry of church, Sutton, Sutton Church, the name of the church, slandered, criticized by gossips in that church. I read that in Leslie Flynn's book, uh, Great Church Fights. I don't think that's true. I don't think there ever, ever is a great church fight, but boy, it made for some interesting reading. Flynn tells in that book about uh, two churches that had a split, the one congregation split from another, and, and they were at odds with each other, and they couldn't get over it. I mean, they just could not get over it. And it just so happened that both of the churches were on the same street within a few hundred feet. And the story was they would hear one congregation be singing and they'd sing the old the old hymns, that song, Will There Be Any Stars in My Crown? And when the 
church that didn't like him would hear that, they'd say, no, not one, no, not one. And then the second church would climb, chime back in and they'd sing, oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. Isn't that stupid? Isn't that the way it is? You see, sometimes your enemy can be hmm, somebody that sits in the church every Sunday, not too far from you. Isn't that a horrible way to live your life? And I hope that tonight, maybe the Lord will speak to us pointedly. As I go through this, I hope that the Lord will use these words from the great apostle Paul to speak to our hearts and help us to smooth some relationships out. Isn't it terrible when people get fractures in the body, fractures in the relationship? And uh, to be honest with you tonight, we don't have a chance if it wasn't for Jesus Christ. You can't uh, pull off what Paul's going to talk about unless God's living in you, unless the Holy Spirit's empowering you, unless you come to the foot of the cross and allow God's Spirit to just indwell you. Now, we've been over this chapter 12. Let me remind you what we've studied so far. You remember what it says in chapter 12, verse 1? It says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He says in this verse, he says, Christians should be consecrated. Christians should be consecrated. And then verse number two, he goes a step further and he says, and don't be conformed to the world, but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So he says we ought to be consecrated, but we need to be transformed with a renewed mind. And then notice what he says in verse three. He says we're to have a new evaluation of ourselves. Look at what it says. For I say through the grace that's given unto me, everyone that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to God has dealt, dealt every man a measure of faith. And so here he talks about having the right evaluation of ourselves. We have a, a new purpose, and he's going to now talk about spiritual gifts, and he's going to say, hey, we don't live for ourselves. We don't die for ourselves. God gave us these gifts so that we can be a blessing to those in the body, and we, we have to use our lives as, as an uh, agent of healing and blessing to others because God's gifted us that way. Now, let's start Roman numeral one, and I'll kind of run through here. Let me let me give you my outline so if I don't, if I mess it up, you'll get it, all right? First of all, we're going to give you some basic facts to remember. I'll give you two, and then he's going to talk about some needed principles, and that's where we're going to dive into verses 14 and following, and there he's going to give us four of those, and then We'll, uh, we'll look at uh, the third thing, and the third thing basically is that how God wants us to live, and I'll give you some applications and we'll be done, okay? Let's see what we can do. Let's see how we can make this work. What are some basic facts to remember? Well, uh, people have, uh, in my opinion, run wild with this passage, and verse number 20 uh, let me read that for you. It says, therefore, if thine enemy hunger and feed him, if he thirst, give him drink, for in so doing, you heap coals of fire upon his head. You know, there were some churches in Vietnam that would give money and make bandages and give clothing to the North Viet Cong. And they'd say, hey, that's the verse. That's why we do that. Now, is that really what the verse is saying? Is the verse really saying that we ought to take enemies that would destroy us and take care of them? Is that is that what this is teaching? Is that what this verse is saying? Well, let me just say this. First of all, this passage is, number one, it's personal, not national. I'm not talking about how America should, t should treat some in the Middle East or uh, like Iraq, Afghanistan. I'm not talking about that. If we took these verses out of context, it'd be hard to follow uh, some of the things our government does, like putting certain nations under embargoes, like we do Iran. Uh, 
or North Korea or passing tariffs on to China and other places like that. You see, uh, Scripture uh, has a particular place. Uh, I think you'd say maybe a pop, uh, 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 a proper place for war. I don't think this verse is trying to teach that we ought to be pacifists. I don't believe that at all. Israel was, to told, was told to take land, to possess land. Uh, it involved killing their enemies. So how do you justify killing your enemies for Old Testament Israel and then taking these verses that Paul's talking about here and uh, how do we deal with our enemies? So it's got to be personal. It's not national. The passage deals with a relationship between individuals, not nations. So make sure you get that. He's talking about how as believers we relate to people who for some reason become our enemies. That's what he's talking about. And then the second thing I would say is this. The counsel in this passage is attainable, attainable, not idealistic. It's attainable, not idealistic. Some would listen to this passage as I teach this evening, and they'd say, well, I'm not like that. I can't pull that off, Pastor Phil. There's no way I could ever be like that. How could I come from such a long line of fighters? I'm just like my mom. She wouldn't take any guff off anybody. Why should I? I could say from my own experience, well, I'm from up there in Kentucky, man. We're a bunch of moonshiners. We we were tobacco uh, growers up there. We had tobacco farms. And man, you mess with me, I'll shoot you. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, uh, several of our folks went to jail. But anyways, I come from a long line of fighters. I'm just like my dad, or I'm just like my mom or my grandma. She could hold a grudge, and so do I. But do you think that's what he's talking about? Uh, look at the context. Verse number three, he says, think soberly. He says, use sound judgment. Look at chapter 13, verse one, look over there. It says, let every soul be subject unto higher powers. Hey, what's he saying in that verse? He's saying, obey the law. You see, these are imperative. These, these verses are obtainable. These verses are like, oh, bottom line is you can do it. You're supposed to do it. That's what he's talking about. I've heard people say, well, these verses are just for preachers. Only preachers can do this. It's like somehow the preacher's special and he's got some in spot with God and him and God are kind of like that. No, 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 no. This is a passage that talks to all of us. It's it's a passage that is obtainable. It's not idealistic. It's, it's written to personal individuals, not to nations. Now, let's jump into it. Let's see what he says. Let's look at some of these needed principles and let's see how it applies to difficult people that we face in our life. Look at uh, verse number 14. It says it this way. Bless them that persecute you, bless and curse not. First of all, he's going to talk about this. He's going to say, you got to manipulate your mindset. You got to manipulate your mindset. You know what he's basically saying? Man, this isn't natural. What I'm asking you to do is something that you, your flesh just rebels against. What I'm asking you to do is to bless those that curse you. You say, Pastor, what's the natural thing to do? Well, blast them, not bless them. Uh, when somebody says something ugly to you, what do you do? You say something ugly back. That's what the natural man does. When somebody takes a jab at you, the, the natural mindset is to jab back. So what does it mean to bless? Did you know that's the word we get for our word for eulogy? Whenever you stand up and you say nice words about somebody's deceased, you eulogize them, you say nice things about them, you bless them. That's the idea. Uh, Paul says, hey, you need to speak well of them. It's the same word we get eulogized from. We need to speak well of the person that's died. You know, the Arabs have a custom I've always thought was... Uh, Pretty cool. I don't know if it's always sincere, but do you ever see them? They touch their head, they touch their lips, they touch their heart, they touch their head, they touch their lips, they touch their heart. And basically they say that if they do that, they're they're paying you a compliment. Uh, the, the gesture means I think highly of you, I speak well of you, and my heart beats for you. 
This is the attitude that we should have towards those that oppose us. That's what Paul's saying. Uh, what's our typical mindset? Well, Thomas Jefferson wrote in his book, uh, Rules to Live By, he said, when angry, count to 10. When really angry, count to 100. Mark Twain came along a couple years later and he says, man, when you're angry, what do you do? He says, uh, uh, when, you're really, when you're really angry, he said, swear, swear. Jesus says, Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, remember what he said? Bless, blessed are you when men will revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven, so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. You remember that passage that Jesus said? You may want to look with me on this. He starts off at the end of chapter 15 in the Gospel of John. Let's look over there just for a moment. Look at John chapter 15. Let's look at the last few verses. John chapter 15, you got it? It says in John 15, look at what it says. It says uh, in verse number 25, but this comes to pass, the word would be fulfilled that's written in their law, that they hated me. I'm in John 15, 25. They hated me without a cause. But when the Comforter, that's the Holy Spirit, has come, that I'll send to you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me, and he will bear witness, because you've been with me from the beginning. 16.1, you got it? These things I've spoken unto you, that you should not be offended, that they should put you out of the synagogue, yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he does God's service. These things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. And these things have I told you that at that time shall come. You'll remember that I told you of them. And these things I said unto you at the beginning because I was with you. Jesus warned his disciples. He said, listen, listen, there's coming a day that they're going to persecute you. And that's what Paul's saying here in Romans chapter 12 and verse number 14. He says, bless don't curse, bless, don't curse. You say, how do you do that, pastor? How do you pull that off? Well, first of all, I think you better uh, learn how to manipulate your mindset. That's that's kind of being like Jesus, isn't it? That that, that goes counter culture, doesn't it? That, that goes against the grain. Uh, I was reading not too long ago, D.O. Moody in one of his service, uh, sermons, he pictures the Lord Jesus after his resurrection, and he's given directions to the apostle Peter. He says, go and, and find the man. He said, to, to thrust the spear into my side and tell him there's a quicker way to my heart. Find the man who crowned me with thorns and tell him I'd like to give him a crown of life. Man, what a dramatic way of depicting the spirit of real Christianity. What an incredible way of talking about how that Jesus said, man, pray for those that despitefully use you. So first of all, if we're going to act this way, we're going to have to learn how to manipulate our mindset. But then secondly, we're going to have to learn how to match the mood, their mood. Look, if you would, in chapter number 12, verse 15, it says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. Look at 16. Be of the same mind one towards another. You see, we need to put ourselves in the frame of reference is the idea. We need to have the same mindset, the same mood of those. And so the Bible says that when your enemy rejoices, you rejoice. He says when your enemy weeps, you weep. You see, most of us, we'd rather, rege we'd rather rejoice when they're weeping and we'd rather weep <laughs> when they're rejoicing. You see, it's completely different, isn't it? Uh, remember what Jesus, the shortest verse in the Bible, John eleven thirty five. 35. You remember quoting that when you was a kid? Jesus wept. What's that verse all about? Jesus goes to the graveside of his good friend Lazarus and there he stands with his two sisters and they're weeping. And one says, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And she weeps and she cries. And Jesus is moved with compassion, even though she's poking him in the chest, even though she's kind of telling off the Lord. 
You see, uh, Jesus taught us something there, didn't he? Jesus taught us that a truly great Christian learns how to rejoice and weep at the right time. That's what he's talking about. I had a fellow one time that did me dirty, didn't treat me fairly, very unethically. He cheated me. He was a thief. And I'll never forget uh, telling my wife that someday it would catch up with him. Someday it would catch up with him. By the way, it did. It did. Um, he was publicly disgraced. He was kicked out of the ministry. He's now been married three times. He's had nothing but heartache in his life. And I'll never forget when I finally heard that he had finally been found out. I'd been carrying that for, I don't know, three or four, five, six years, something like that. And I caught myself rejoicing. Oh man, thank God. He's finally got what's coming to him. Boy, did the Holy Spirit convict me. He took all the joy out of that rejoicing. It was amazing. You see, the problem is I'm to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice. And my problem is probably like yours. I, I like to weep when they rejoice and rejoice when they're weeping. The Bible says it's got to be completely opposite. And so he says, hey, you got to match, you got to match their mood. But notice something else. He says, you got to mind your manners. Look at chapter 12, verse number 16. He goes on, he says, be of the same mind one towards another. Mind not high things. Don't get conceited. Don't be proud. That's the idea. But condescend to men of low estate. You know, the Bible, when you read down through the book of James, James, remember, was the half-brother of Christ. And James gives some great practical advice. And he talks about uh, church service. And he says, you know what? Some of you are slaves and some of you work for some of these unfair masters. And he said, man, he says, when they come to church, he said, you guys give up the front row. You give them the pillow to sit on. You give them the best seat in the house. He said, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, isn't it easy to be partial? Isn't it easy to uh, basically um, treat rich people different than it, we do poor people? Uh, to treat somebody with more influence a different way than we sit, treat somebody with no influence? One time I was uh, at the Walmart over in Madison and Little gal, she looked at me and she said, do you remember who I am? I said, no, sweetie, I'm sorry, I don't. She said, and she gave me her name and I remembered the name. I don't know why I didn't remember her face other than the fact that it would probably been about 10 years since I saw her and she looked completely different. She used to ride a bus, a Sunday school bus in Madison, we used to come to our church back when we was on Neely's Bend. I started talking to her and I said, hey, well, it's good to see you. I hadn't seen you in forever. I didn't recognize you because I, bang, you've grown up. Now you're a grown person. We got talking and we talked back and forth. And I asked her, I said, where are you going to church? And she said, well, I'm not going. I said, well, why not? And she kind of him all around. So I pressed it a little bit further. And I said, well, why'd you stop coming to Metro? And she said, well, I was told by somebody uh, that if you rode the bus, they looked down on you. You were a second-class citizen down there at that church. Boy, my heart broke. My heart broke. And I, I tried to talk to her. I said, sweetheart, we would, we would never do that. You have as much right and privilege as anybody else at that church. We appreciate you coming, and we'd love for you to come back. By the way, she did, and I was pleased to see her, but you know, but the scripture in this verse says, mind not high things, but condescend of men of low estate. Condescend of men of low estate. So don't be partial. He goes a step further. He says in verse 16, he says, don't be proud. Look at you with verse 16, mind not the high things, but condescend of men, uh, men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Be not wise in your own conceit. It's talking about pride. It's talking about pride. You see, pride has no place in the Christian life. 
These six things does the Lord hate. Go back and check the list out in Proverbs chapter six. You're going to find that God hates pride. Why? Pride's the the mother of all sins. Pride is a, that was the sin that got Satan kicked out of heaven. I I I I I I I. That's what got him kicked out. So God hates pride. You know, sometimes uh, some people in churches are like Diotrephes in Second. Uh, second John chapter chapter one verse nine, where it talks about the Diotrephes. He loves to have the preeminence. Something wrong with that. When Jesus described himself in Matthew chapter eleven verse number twenty nine, he says, "I am meek and lowly. I am meek and lowly." You see. Uh, one of the great things about the Lord is the Lord didn't have a high opinion of himself, even though he could have. And and when you read this, uh, Paul says, don't don't be wise in your own conceit. We could look at Romans eleven twenty five, Romans twelve sixteen, Proverbs chapter three verse two, Proverbs twenty five verse five, Proverbs twenty five verse twelve, Proverbs twenty five verse six, Proverbs twenty eight eleven. I don't have time to turn, but you can mark those down. Look it up. God hates pride. But let me add quickly, he says, you need to also mark their methods. So uh, verse 17, he says it look this way. He says uh, in verse 17, he says, recompense to no man evil for evil. How do most people live? Do unto others for they do it unto you. No, the Bible says live uh, passively, we 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 don't retaliate. We don't get even. I saw a bumper sticker years ago out in California said, "I I, I don't get mad. I get even." And the guy had a big, huge truck with a big, huge bumper, and I thought, "Holy mackerel! He could do some some real damage to your car if he ever wanted to get even." Uh, scripture says, "Hey, bottom line is, don't live your life that way." Don't recompense to others evil for evil. Don't keep the score. Don't go around uh, checking off your gun, putting notches on your gun because somebody shot at you first. Hey, if there's anybody in the scriptures that ever learned the secret of that, I think it was the great the great David in the Old Testament. Get King David. Um, you see that story with him in the cave of Odalum with Saul. You remember the story? Um, there he is, he gets a chance and, and Saul's indisposed. He's doing his business, so to speak. And, and his men are hiding in the shadows. They said, David, this is your chance. God's put him into your hands. Get him, go ahead and kill him. Well, David cuts off a little bit of his skirt and then his sensitive spirit, the spirit of God convicted his heart. He went outside, laid flat on the ground. He said, oh, Saul, so I messed up big time. I, I took advantage of the Lord's anointed. And he said, that's not the way to live. That's not the way to live. By the way, that really isn't the way to live. When you start recompensing evil to evil, boy, you're going to have a hard time keeping up with it all. I remember when I was a kid growing up, my granddad used to tell me a story. Granddad didn't have a big farm by the time I got around there because mm, he was working regular. The depression was gone and there was no need to. He worked 3 to 11 at the railroad shop and he was a foreman down there. They made the cars on the railroad, those uh, box cars. And um, Granddad would have maybe one cow and he'd milk that cow and he'd get his milk from that cow and raised a, a good sized garden, put up all, everything. But granddad told me a story one time. He said, but when you get more than one cow, he said, you'd have to milk all of those cows and that's where you got your milk and that's where you got your, your butter. And he said, the problem is, he said, inevitably, when you get a herd of cows, he said, one of them's going to like to kick. And he said, boy, did you ever have to watch that heifer? You don't ever get comfortable around them because you had to watch that heifer because she's going to kick you. And granddad used to say, and the problem is that one cow would kick another cow and then the cow would kick another cow and the cow would kick another cow. 
Now you've got several cows that are kicking. He said, man, it was a mess. Pretty soon all the cows were kicking and milling and mooing. He said, man, alive. You said, what's the problem, pastor? That's what I'm talking about. Hey, that's recompensing evil for evil. You kicked me, so bless God, I'm going to kick you back. That's no way to live. He says, live passively, but notice live periodically. Look at verse number 11. Look at the way this reads. It says in verse 11, uh, or verse number 17, let me get the right verse. He says, provide things honest in the sight of all men. It's an interesting verse. It says, um, you ought to have regard. You ought to have regard for good things. Uh, you ought to have regard for uh, the ability to, to, to see, to take thought of, to have regard for. He said, man, it's not the best way to live, to see the bad in people. He said, man, you ought to regard the best things. Look at the best traits. Isn't it easy to pick out the worst things, the irritating things that you see around you? I tell you what, you want to ruin your marriage? Camp on the faults of your mate. That'll do it. Camp on the faults of your mate. Boy, is she ever gaining weight. Those aren't love handles. Those are buckets. <laughs> better look out. You better look out. Um, I tell you what, you better, you better learn how to Live and let live on that deal. You might, you might want to have the same uh, same thing going your way. She could say, look at that bald-headed idiot. Look at that crazy dingbat. I, I married him years ago. He had hair, and he used to be 30 pounds lighter, and he used to actually have a chest at one time. Well, bottom line is, better be careful. You <laughs> better be careful. He says in this verse, he said, provide things honest in the sight of men. And then look at verse 18. He says, live peaceably. He says, if it's possible, as much as lies in you, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. Now, let's move along because we want to get down to verse 19 and I need to get done. And let me see, I'm at 37 minutes right now and I'm starting to get, I'm sure, old for some of you. So let's look at this just for a second. He says, lastly, he says, live positively. Look at what it says in verse 19. He says, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now there's a perspective that we need to get here. If we're going to live positive, we get a right perspective, and that is vengeance belongs to God. Vengeance belongs to God. Uh, let God handle it. It's God's problem. Uh, New King James Version says it this way. Give place to wrath. A good translation there. That wrath belongs to God. That wrath belongs to God. Hey, bottom line is vengeance isn't mine. Vengeance is God's. I was reading a, uh, Warren Wearsby a little while ago. Warren Wearsby talks in his uh, book, uh, Be Wise on Romans. He says he had a preacher friend that came to him one time and he was listening to the radio and he had a kind of a falling out with this radio preacher. And and uh, they had known each other for years. And boy, I mean to tell you, this radio preacher decided to get even on the radio. And he said some things that were untrue and very unwise. And boy, I mean to tell you, this guy, he was hot. He was bent out of shape. And he said, I'm going to get even with him. I'm going to do this and do that and do this and do that. And, the, and Warren Wiersbe stopped him. He said, hey, listen, he said, you better not. He said, why? He said, you want God to get involved in it, don't you? He said, vengeance is God's. It's not yours. Let God take care of it. By the way, that's pretty good advice. When he talks about revenge here, he says, uh, you better make sure you recognize that vengeance belongs to the Lord. And he does a pretty good job with it, doesn't he? So, Let's kind of move along. Let, let me kind of wrap it up because I really need to. Uh, let me give you some foundation formulas on how we should love one another. And let's, uh, let's, let me just give you a couple of things real quick, okay? First of all, don't become a victim of evil. If you treat your enemies the way you're supposed to, uh, you'll never become a victim of their evil. I think that's very important. And then... How do you conquer evil? You always conquer evil 
with God. Let's, let's close it up by a guy that learned this the hard way. Let's look at Peter, okay? Look at 1 Peter chapter number 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And let's look, if you would, at verse about verse number 19, okay? It says in verse number 19, uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, you got it? It says it this way. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience towards God endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Now, by the way, if you suffer because you got it coming, there's no glory in that. If you're acting like a knucklehead and you get your head wrapped, a wrapped, hey, you got it coming. Look at what it reads. It goes, it says in verse number 20, it says, well, what glory is it when you're buffeted for your faults, when you take it patiently? Oh, what a good Christian I am. I didn't gripe and complain. Well, you shouldn't. You had it coming. You're an idiot. How's that for saying it the way it is? He goes on, he says, verse 21, for even hereunto were you called because Christ also suffered for us. By the way, why did he go to the cross? Why did he die in our place? Was it because he had to? Was it because he had something in his life that he deserved it? He left us an example that we should follow in his steps. Verse 22, he says, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, who when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you're healed. Well, you think Peter had to learn that one the hard way? Quite honest with you, I don't think he learns it any harder than what I've had to. <laughs> Boy, it's hard to treat your enemies the right way, isn't it? Uh, Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And, and somebody that learned that was a guy named Stephen. As they threw the rocks and beat his brains out, he looked out at that crowd. And there was one guy over there holding the coats whose name was Saul. And he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. St. Augustine said the church owes Saul, who later becomes Paul, to the prayers of Stephen. There's a good word there, isn't there? Let's pray. Lord, bless us. Help us to learn how to treat other people the way you want us to. God, help us not to treat them like enemies, but Lord, help us to treat them the way we're supposed to. In Jesus' name, amen.